Well, it is 3 o'clock p.m. Thank you all for joining today's webinar. Um, I'm Katherine Brown, Director of Communities of Practice at the National Center for Medical Education, Development, and Research at Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. This is our Communities of Practice webinar entitled Making Communities of Practice Work, Connecting Theory with Practice. Today is May 15, 2018. The National Center for Medical Education, Development, and Research is housed at Meharry Medical College in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. Our focus is on transforming medical education for vulnerable populations. The three populations that we focus on are persons who identify as LGBTQ, homeless, or migrant farm workers. This project is supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, of the United States Department of Health and Human Services under grant number UH1HP30343, entitled Academic Units for Primary Care Training and Enhancement. This informational content and conclusions are those of the author and should not be construed as an official position or policy of, nor should any endorsements be inferred by HRSA, HHS, or the U.S. government. We are under the me. leadership of Dr. Patricia Matthews Juarez Catherine. and Dr. Paul Juarez. Catherine, excuse you, me. Ask you. people to, to uh, mute their mute microphones. And as we have on our next slide, if everyone can please mute your microphone, because we are getting a lot of feedback today. Uh, I think we've solved it. No. no. Well, we're going to try to press through it. This webinar is being recorded. We will address questions during the Q&A section. Thank you for joining, and please type your questions in the chat box. And as you join, please type your name and institution in the chat box. Our learning objectives for this webinar is to define communities of practice, understand the concepts of communities of practice, and identify two ways that COPs can be implemented and applied in medical education, and identify myths about communities of practice. Today's speakers are Etienne Wanger, trainer, researcher, author, and consultant and pioneer of the Communities of Practice Research. He is a globally recognized thought leader in the field. And Beverly Wanger, trainer, who is a researcher, author, and international social learning consultant. And I'm Catherine Brown, and I'll be your moderator. I am going to turn my slide over to you. All right, I'll stop to share. And as a reminder, as we do that, please mute your microphone, please. And also, actually, what would be great is if, um, as we go, if you could type your questions or your thoughts or your insights or your wonderings or your uncertainties or your challenges in the chat as we go. We're going to watch the chat. And uh, we much prefer to sort of integrate things as we go rather than just simply wait to the end and answer questions. So please just go ahead and type in. So go here. And Etienne, I mean, I think Etienne has actually the, the he coined the term community of practice. So I always think it's interesting to hear how the term came about. Yeah, and so we're going to do, do this, uh, present the theory as it has evolved over the last 30 years, um, because it's going to be interesting to see how the concept of community of practice itself has expanded uh, with our experience with it. And so very early on, um, we coined the term community of practice. I was working with an anthropologist, uh, her name is Jean Lev, and she had uh, studied apprenticeship in West Africa among tailors um, and we were looking at uh, how can we uh, develop an understanding of learning as a phenomenon in and of itself and not simply as the result of teaching. That was kind of the, the, the charter of the institute where we were doing this research and looking at apprenticeship uh, uh, in different historical contexts 
we noticed that in fact apprenticeship is not just a relationship between a master and an apprentice, but there is a whole community there. And if you are a young apprentice and you don't know how to do something, you don't go to the master, you go to another apprentice who is a little bit ahead of you. And that's what we call the committee of practice. And once we had this concept, then we could start theorizing learning at this journey into a community of practice and the transformation of who you are from a non-member to a full member of that community of practice. And uh, Kathleen has asked different, uh, that, that we would, by the end of this uh, presentation, have different ways of thinking about how to apply the concept to medical education. And uh, a researcher called Tim Dornan, uh, who used to be at the uh, University of Manchester and he's now uh, in Ulster, uh, has actually used this theory to look at the transformation of identity from a non-doctor to a doctor. And he has very much seen the, the formation of a medical, a, a, a medical practitioner as a journey into a community and looked at the different uh, moment in the journey that give these new doctors a sense of identity as being a doctor and has has highlighted these moments as, as being central educational moments in the formation of doctors. And um, I mean that's that's what it looks like in, in theory. In practice, what does it look like? Well here's a here's a picture of a community of practice in this is a community of practice in eastern africa so the countries in this community of practice are kenya uganda tanzania ethiopia and the latest country uh, in the region which was south sudan and they are members of parliament who hold uh, they belong to the public accounts committee which is responsible for oversight of uh, government spending and in one of the most important practices that they have is of um, holding a public hearing. But it's quite hard to hold a public hearing for the first time. And in South Sudan, as they were a new public, uh, a new public accounts committee, they were really unsure how to hold a public hearing and didn't even know if they had the confidence to because corruption is so uh, endemic. And so what the rest of the community did was to organize a role play of a public hearing, which took a whole, actually took a whole day. And the more experienced countries played the role of government ministers, of government ministers who are coming to, um, uh, uh, who are being held to account by the public accounts committee. And the South Sudanese played the public, pub, played the, the, the people running the public hearing. And they went through the whole thing from entering the door from um, putting your hand on the Bible to swear to tell the truth and they conducted a public hearing and um, at the end of the day the more experienced members of the public accounts committees gave them feedback gave South Sudan feedback on what they'd done well and the places where they should have you know maybe called in the police or uh, where the where they as government ministers had been trying to trick them so this was a, um, a really a use of phase one of the theory in practice, where it's a real practice. A public hearing is what is a key practice in the life of a public accounts committee. And they were learning from each other how to do it. Because one thing was, this was a, actually a project that was convened by the World Bank. The World Bank traditionally would send somebody in to explain how to do it, to give a few lectures, to maybe give a training course. Uh, but they discovered that actually people learn much better from each other as practitioners who actually knew the details of the practice. Because often uh, theories of learning would assume that if you get the right knowledge, then practice should be unproblematic. But our experience is that actually you need to be engaged in authentic practice to really 
uh, transform your ability to do things in the world. And this is this is this phase, uh, what we call phase one of the theory. It was very much based on on the apprenticeship model. But the apprenticeship model, I mean, sort of assumes that the practice already exists, um, that there is a practice to learn about. And actually, when I came into, uh, I came into what we call phase two of the theory, um, where I was working actually at a business school in, in, in Portugal, and I was teaching uh, students English for academic and specific purposes. And what I realized is that my, I wasn't interested in community practice at all. I was interested in what, what were the sort of specific genres that my students had to perform in. They weren't learning English because, uh, because they wanted to go to England. They learnt, were learning English because they wanted to live in Portugal uh, and interact in international settings. And so I followed uh, Annabella Fernandes, who was a very successful uh, international business person in Portugal, based in Portugal, headhunted by international companies. And she was a great person to follow because actually her English was not very good. Uh, so I followed her everywhere, in her meetings, at lunch times, in her interviews. And um, one of the things that I found fascinating was how she made sense of international business with this network of other international directors in Portugal who she'd worked with in previous companies. And so, for example, when entrepreneurship became part of managerial discourse back in the, back in the 90s, and in Portugal they had to implement entrepreneurialism and managers had to be you know, measured on their um, entrepreneurialism, in Portugal, which had only just got its independence in 74, or got free of a, of, of a dictatorship regime, where innovation and taking the initiative wasn't encouraged, it was a hard thing to translate entrepreneurialism into the Portuguese context, managerial context. And yet she and her network sort of worked it out. So what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And at that time, Etienne's book, uh, 98 book, Learning, Meaning and Identity came out. And I read about communities of practice and I thought, oh, that's interesting. I think what she's got here is a community of practice. And it's not that they are learning a practice that's already there. The practice of being an international manager, a good international manager in the Portuguese context, is something that's being worked out as we go. And anyway, I um, gave her that finding in amongst five, uh, five findings. And when I came back to validate the results with her, she had drawn a big red line around that bit of community practice. And she said, Beverly, that is why I am successful in business, is because I have a community of practice. And so that helped me to know that something was happening there. But it's quite different, this uh, phase two was quite different in the sense that the practice didn't already exist. If you're a, an apprentice at a tailor, you'll be coming a tailor and the competence of being a good tailor already exists. But in this one, it's unknown. So it's learning what we don't yet know. And here is a, an implementation of this version uh, uh, this is a, a, a project of the World Bank, and around this table you have people who are head of uh, um, head of treasury in different countries in Southeast Asia, and um, they are discussing together how to develop a good relationship with the central bank. You don't have to be uh, worry about the details of it, just that it is culturally a difficult thing to do in these countries uh, where often cultural and, and, and religious context make make uh, uh, the collection of interest something uh, complicated. So again here, you have a group of people who are forming a learning partnership around something that they need to know how to do, but there is no master around this table. It's not like there is an existing master and everybody would like to become like that master. No, they, they don't know how to do it, but they think that if, we, if, they, if they think together how to do it, then they have a better chance of, 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 of learning 
uh, um, how to be successful uh, by helping each other, by discussing it around this table. Actually, at the end of this meeting, they meet three times a year. At the end of this meeting, they have come up with some guidelines. They're going to go, go back home, try those guidelines, come back, think whether those guidelines were, 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 were useful or not, and keep going like this until they feel that they have helped each other uh, achieve uh, good relationships with the central bank. So again, the committee of practice, but without a master, learning together what is not yet known. And when we talk about a learning partnership, it's not like you're either in a learning partnership or not. We often, we often um, compare a learning partnership to a relationship, right? So, um, you know, at the beginning of a relationship, in the, just as in the beginning of a community of practice, people don't really know, it's a little tentative, people don't really know whether or not they're going to be partners. You, as a, if you're a matchmaker, you might want to bring, you know, two friends together who you know have, it, you know, have something in common and, uh, you know, make it a kind of event where you're sure that they'll be able to talk to each other and have enough time to discover each other and to see if they want to continue to date. And that's very similar to community practice. Right at the beginning, you don't know if it's going to work or not. And you don't know, you don't have a plan necessarily. It's like, not like a team where you have a work plan and everybody's going to contribute to the work plan and going to achieve this. No, you, the, it's, a living, it's a living partnership where people are discovering and rediscovering new ways of being together and new ways of, of, of learning together in the same way that in a relationship, what made you fall in love at the beginning is not necessarily what holds you together at the end of your life, but the, the relationship has evolved and produced value uh, in, in, in new ways. So here, here, we're going to show you a few pictures of communities working together. This is a community in, in, uh, in the field of uh, transparency and accountability in, in, um, in development, international development. And the researcher there in the middle is uh, presenting a case. She, she wants to do a research project and involve uh, local people, and she doesn't quite know how to do it. So everybody uh, in the community is helping her work through her case, and she, she felt well, it's a case clinic it's rather a case than clinic, a case. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, a term that we borrowed from from uh, from medicine, um, and and so the whole community is is learning together by addressing the challenge that she brought to the table. So for her, her presence to the community was to bring a challenge that others could sink their teeth into and 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 work up together. And so again, you can see that. As a learning theory, see, very often we think of learning as being, as being driven by people who know, by the knowledge that exists, or by people who know. Or by a curriculum. Or by a curriculum. But it's by something, it's, it's by something that's pretty sure and certain. Right? But in a community practice, the learning is driven by what people don't know. So the biggest contributors in a community of practice are those people who are uncertain, who are hungry to make progress, hungry to know, and not because they're going to know from somebody who already does know, but because they're, they're willing to share their challenge and others are willing to share their stories about how they dealt with the same thing and what happened as a result. Here, this is the same activity, but we were doing it online. So Catherine on the left, uh, uh, lower left there was presenting her case and everybody else uh, uh, was, was debating it. And so it was the same activity, but it was an online version of it. Uh, just to show that many of these activities can have, uh, can have online versions. You don't necessarily need to be face to face in the same room to engage in, that, in those kind of activities. But actually, just also to go back to that, again, to reinforce the idea that, like here we're using a webinar in, in a sort of more traditional way, which is for us to share with you what we know. 
but actually very successful community of practice use online spaces instead of hearing from somebody who knows, but to hear from somebody who doesn't know. So, needs to know. or somebody who needs to know something. They have a challenge and they want everybody, and it can be, it is, it, people report it being very powerful learning. So this is a series of case clinics over a period of a year where people felt like they learned enormously, not because anybody was ever presenting what they knew, but because people were coming with what they didn't know and what they wanted help on. And really those people are all over the world, a person in Dubai, a person in Italy, a person on us in Australia, people in the US, somebody in Canada. Mm -hmm. So really this technology has allowed us to, to, to do these things uh, across distance. Here is a, a, an activity where different projects in the community have created a little booth, a little poster, and they are visiting each other to try to understand what other members of the community is, uh, are, are doing. This one is just a debate, you know, a traditional high school debate where we have two teams, one on one side, one on the other, we bring them together, they debate an issue, in this case, they just need to know whether some budgeting had to be done centrally or, or in, in a local government. And there were two sides of the issue. They were at the debate really uh, active, but you were put in a team where, it, uh, not by, by what you believe, we just put at random in one team or another. And this is a good activity because in a community, a danger is when, when, you, when you have group think and it becomes difficult to express a doubt or to express a disagreement. So here we make it a game that you have to disagree with the position so that uh, it creates a, a, a sharper uh, form of thinking. But again, to, um, how, this, how this works, how this works when we look at this picture is that here is a country, because the, the members of this community are, well, different districts actually in, a, in, a in country, Kyrgyzstan. Eh? In Kyrgyzstan, yeah. And they're debating whether or not things should be done centrally or, or regionally because they don't quite know which way to go themselves. So they really want to explore both sides of the argument. So they put it out to their community to think through the both sides of the argument. And they, um, they debate it and then the, uh, the district or the region that was presenting uh, the debate will go back, take into consideration all that they heard from the community and implement it and then at the next meeting come back to the meeting and say thanks guys or we, what advice we took was this and this, this is how we implemented it and this was the result. And so community of practice works over time there's a sort of, the importance of a community of practice is that it becomes a container into which you bring back the results of what you tried out in practice. And so it's an ongoing loop between, try, between learning from your community, trying it out from pra in practice, seeing what the result is, and bringing that back to the community to loop back into the learning. This is actually a group of uh, uh, foundations that do infectious disease surveillance. And after the e Ebola crisis, they felt they needed to come together to, uh, uh, to share what they were doing and find ways to do things together. So uh, on, on the wall there, you can see the different organizations in the column. And on the row are different questions that they had for each other. And so each organization answered these different questions like, for instance, are you, do you develop vaccines or not? You know? And so each organization said in green, yes, we do that. In blue, we would like to learn how to do that. And in red, no, we don't do that. This is out of scope for our organization. And so what they are doing is kind of building a picture of their community and of what the different members are doing to try to find learning opportunities that if somebody is doing something really well and lots of people would like to learn how to do it, like maybe the third column where there are lots of blues and, 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 and one green, then you can see, well, they, here is here's a, a, a way that our community could, could learn together uh, how, how to do something. So this is an activity uh, uh, that, that we have created to help a community develop a representation of itself to find, to find learning opportunities.
And actually, what we didn't tell you about this slide, which we saw before, was in our, in our consulting practice more recently, we've had actually very much more complex communities. So we've been talking about learning partnerships between people who share similar challenges in practice. But actually, this community was a very much more complex one because it had three different stakeholders in the room who normally are not learning partners. So there were NGOs, funders and researchers. And what it was, was the funding organizations wanted to, uh, wanted to know the money that we're giving to, be, to the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, we, we don't want to just get a check, checkbox um, reply as to how the project's going. We want to know what you're actually learning. But of course, NGOs would say, well, we're not going to tell you if things didn't go right or not, um, which is where most of our learning happens. Uh, so, you know, that's not the kind of conversation we have with our funders. And also the kind of conversations we have with our researchers, who, the researchers who come out to our NGOs and do our evaluations. Well, whatever it is they're doing, it has nothing to do with what we do in practice. That's more for their academic um, journals and nothing to do with us. So we were starting to see um, a willingness between different types of stakeholders who normally don't speak together, but realizing that they have to come together in order to learn from and with each other. And in, this case, in order to really realize a learning partnership, there's a lot of boundary work to do, uh, for instance, between the funders and the, and the NGOs, there's a lot of mistrust and, and tensions and power relationships, the funders having the money and the NGOs needing that money. So you can see that it's, it's, it's a community of practice where there is, it's not immediately obvious that these people are good learning partners and that they can together establish new practices, new ways of doing granting so that there is learning happening uh, uh, in the process. So the, 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 that's a very interesting kind of community because there are very different perspectives in that community and, and the ability to learn depends on whether these perspectives can find a way to interact uh, uh, productively. So conceptually in this phase three, we would call this a phase three kind of community where the boundaries are inside the community as well as around the community. Uh, uh, a learning potential that exists at the crossroad of different communities and then uh, bringing them together in new ways uh, in order to, um, yeah, to improve the learning capability of the system, if you will. And so we said that, that we were uh, going to talk about different ways of using communities of practice in medicine. Uh, um, and so we were going to propose that in phase two, what you're doing, kind of like trying to bring communities of practice together to learn how to serve these, these populations. We don't know how to do it, but you know, if we put our brains together, we, we, we might be able to. And then here is actually a, a bonus, a third way to use communities of practice in medicine. For instance, at, at the University of Ottawa, they are putting uh, together communities of practice around specific uh, challenges that they have serving the region. For instance, when we were there, they were describing to us the community of practice that... Um, it's a medical university. A medical university, a medical school at the University of Hawaii. Yeah. And they, they're um, in oncology. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it, it's the oncology department building communities of practice around the lung cancer. Uh, they, had, they had lots of problems about references and, 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 and long pathways for people to actually get from diagnosis to treatment. And, uh, and so they brought a multi-stakeholder community of practice to rethink the practice of addressing lung cancer in the region, uh, uh, decreased waiting time substantially by bringing these people together for a, a discussion of practice from different perspectives, including administrators, uh, clinicians, uh, I think they had some patients, and, and uh, yeah, a, a different, different stakeholders engaging in a reflection on practice uh, to, to, to improve the capability of the system. So, uh, Catherine had 
suggested that we give you a definition of a committee of practice, but rather they, they give you a definition of a committee of practice as a set of bullet points, uh, which is the most traditional way of, of giving a definition. We thought that give, we'd give you a, a, a definition in the form of a, a little cartoon, because in fact, <laughs> a committee of practice is not a thing. A committee of practice is a process. And the community of practice is not what happens simply when people are together in their learning partnership doing an activity. Yeah, it's an ongoing process over time, but also over space. Yeah, of learning how to do something, developing a competence together. Uh, so in the first, in the first uh, part of the, of the cartoon, you have people discussing something together. But the important, what's important about that first one is that the people there want to make a difference. They want to make a difference in the world. Right? They care about something, they care about something enough that they want to make a difference. And this is super important because we have seen many communities that are put together because the funding, the funders says, you know, you're gonna build a community of practice. And so to check the box, they build a community of practice and so they have webinars, you know, once a month or something like this, and people are brought to tears. They read the New York Times uh, uh, um, uh, while the so-called committee of practice is taking place. So this idea that a committee of practice really responds to a learning need that is felt and that, that, is, that involves the passion of, of, of the members. So it's not a checkbox thing, the community of practice. But it's also another reason we often see people bringing together for community practice is they say, oh, we're going to share knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now sharing knowledge is all well and good, but that's not, that's not the end result. The end result must be the making of a difference in the world. And so that, the reason people are coming together is because they want to make a difference not because they want to share knowledge, not because they want to collaborate, but because they want to make a difference. And collaboration may or may not be one of the ways to make a difference. Likewise, sharing knowledge may or may not be, right? Always in the service of making a difference in the world. And so people contribute to a community of practice by engaging their uncertainty with each other. So it, if, you, if you have a curriculum and you have students and you're teaching them, in some sense, learning is the transmission of certainty. But a committee of practice works exactly the opposite, is when people engage their uncertainty with each other and find that, that companionship in like, yeah, we don't quite know how to do that. What can we think of ways that we can, we can we could improve our ability to do that. It's that moment of finding people who care about things like you and who are willing to engage in the process of addressing their uncertainty together. That's when you start congealing as a community of practice. But actually also appreciating uncertainty is a relatively easy thing to say, but it takes having the right people around the table. If you are, if you are, um, if you share a practice, it's much easier to, to share your uncertainty because when you say, I don't quite know how to do this, people know because they also feel the same, right? So, you know, if you are, yes, if you're, a, if you are surgeons, you don't, probably don't want to be saying to your patients, well, actually, uh, let's engage in my uncertainty. I want to engage in my uncertainty. But that would be the wrong, wrong people around the table. But with other surgeons, you might, if you can get to the level of saying, you know, talking about the micro decisions that you have to take and which you never quite know if they're going to work or not, that's the level of conversation that you want to see in a community of practice. And out of this mutual engagement of uncertainty, ideas will come up. Hypotheses will come up. Also. Oh, yeah, that's, that sounds promising. So there's this potential. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see the potential of this 
be being making a difference to what I'm trying to do. And actually, we could say that a lot of training sessions and normal and um, traditional teaching sort of goes up to there, but it stops there. It assumes that once you've got the knowledge, once you've got the tools, the ideas, the insights, the definitions, that you'll go out and you'll apply them. Now, the difference in the learning in the community of practice is that the learning is still ongoing. We don't know if learning has happened until somebody has taken them back to their practice and put it to use. Right? Put it to use, uh, you know, change, adapted it, put it to use, and observed the effect. Now, putting it to use, it doesn't mean you put it to use, and if it doesn't work, that it's a failure, right? That you haven't learned. You've learned whether or not the effect is what you expected, if it's an effect that is good or an effect that's bad. And so, we wanted to leave you with this definition of a kind of practice as a loop, you know? It's a collective loop between the activities of the community, trying things out in practice and bringing that back to your community to engage in that process of competence development, continuous improvement of the ability to make a difference in, in the world. So for us, that's that, that that alliance, that partnership around that process is what we would call a community of practice. And so maybe, maybe we should say a few myths, right? Because, because Catherine uh, also put as a, as a learning objective uh, uh, that we would uh, share a few, a few uh, bust a few myths about community of practice. Now there are so many of those. Uh, uh, um, that, but we've busted one already, right? We've By busted. saying it's not about sharing knowledge, it's about engaging in uncertainty together. So that's, that's, that's a, 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 a myth that we, that we have already busted. Um, another myth is that it's always people of the, share, uh, of the same background. Right? In fact, uh, at the University of Ottawa, the communities of practice make progress because they bring different perspectives together in engaging their uncertainties again uh, uh, if 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 the if the administrators don't engage their uncertainty or the clinicians don't engage them, it's not gonna it's not gonna work it's not gonna make a, 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 a progress but it's it's that that collisions of if you will of multiple perspectives in that case allows them to, to make progress. I think another myth is that um, for a community of practice to work, you need a good facilitator. And I mean, a good facilitator is always important, but actually a facilitator who is cheerleading and or um, desperately trying to get people to participate is never the answer for a community of practice. The the secret, the secret source of a community of practice is finding what it is that people care about. Really finding out what they care about, where they want to make a difference, and finding the right people at the table to talk to, so that when they're talking with them, when they are talking together in a learning partnership, they feel like, wow, by talking with these people, this is high value for my time because I am getting such good ideas that I can put into practice and I can't wait to come back and tell people what I've tried and what worked and what didn't work. So finding the right people and finding what people care about is much more important than a good facilitator. Or that's rather, that's what a good facilitator would actually do. But a good facilitator is not about uh, encouraging participation. And actually what we found is that often the people who are best at facilitating a community of practice are practitioners themselves because they come to the community of practice greedy for themselves, greedy for learning themselves. 
And that greed allows them to lead the community of practice in a way that feels authentic rather than artificial. Um, you know, I think this is a, a very powerful discussion. And I'm so honored to have you all on the webinar with us, especially because you coined the, the term communities of practice. Three things I wanted to touch on. You said that it's a living relationship that evolves in new ways, that we have to appreciate the uncertainty and that you must have the right people at the table. And we have a very diverse uh, range of experts who are on the webinar with us right now. Some of them are, are, are consultants, community uh, leaders, academicians, and everyone. So I want to um, continue this discussion, but also open up the uh, webinar for any questions that anyone may have. Because I think in preparation for our upcoming Communities of Practice Conference, this is a, a dynamic uh, webinar. And I think that we all have really expanded our uh, way and the lens in which we view uh, communities of practice. So I thank you.